researchers have raised questions about the ways in which the first wave of major digital archives essentially reinforced the Anglo-American canon. Authors like Walt Whitman, D.G. Rossetti, William Blake, Emily Dickinson, and Henry, Henry David Thoreau were, by about 2008, well represented online by thorough, thoughtfully designed, and technically sophisticated web archives. These archives frequently feature page images of manuscript drafts of the complete works of the authors in question, as well as, in the cases of Whitman and Blake, exceptionally deep access to different versions of printings and key texts, of key texts. This same level of attention was, generally, lacking with reference to minority writers. As Stephanie P. Browner puts it in a recent essay, um, and I think I have that slide before. Oh, no, it's good. Uh, as Stephanie P. Browner puts it in a recent essay, um, scholars of race and ethnicity do not yet um, get online and find themselves in a deep, comprehensive, well-linked, and indexed world of materials. And Browner knows where she speaks. She's edited one of the very few digital archives dedicated to a 19th century African-American writer uh, currently available. So it's a single author archive. I mean, there are other kinds of archives, like slave narrative archives and whatnot. Um, but that she edited the Charles Chestnut Archive, and it's well worth a look. Um, looking beyond the US and Europe to the colonial world, Adeline Coe notes that, oh, no, I did just stick right there. There we go. Adeline Coe, um, uh, where are we? Adeline Coe notes that many open access, publicly funded projects in the literatures of the 19th century concentrate primarily on people of European descent and obscure the impact of imperial endeavors in the 19th century. The digital archives we've been dealing with um, um, in 19th century British literature are, are often a bit quiet about empire for a reason. Many of the above mentioned authors actually had surprisingly little to say about this hugely historical and political reality, a huge historical political reality. Here, I'll be sur surveying some dimensions of this problem, which I'm calling, for simplicity's sake, the archive gap. One aspect of the archive gap, the simplest and most obvious, pertains to whose work is chosen to be archived and whose is not. You don't need a PhD in digital humanities to see that there's a discrepancy. But there's more to it. The archive gap, as I'm conceiving of it, has several dimensions. For, again, for simplicity's sake, I'll split my consideration into two parts, one historical and the other contemporary. And I should also mention, for those of you who are Americanists, I have an alternate version of this talk that I did um, as part of like, a teaching lecture, um, which focuses specifically on archives to 19th century um, African American writers. Um, and you can see that, I think if I have my, yeah, so there's a, um, there, on my blog, if you Google that title, um, Grace the Canon of the Digital Humanities, um, there's sort of, it uses some of the same concepts that I'm talking about here, but it applies them to things like the Charles Chestnut Archive. Um, and a few other examples, um, specifically in the US context. Today I'm more in the British uh, colonial India context. The historical dimensions of the archive gap are largely outside of our control. To put it quite simply, we'll never be able to recover what was never preserved. Authors like Roger Kipling and Walt Whitman left behind manuscript versions of their texts, as well as typescripts. They left behind reams of letters, diaries, sometimes other kinds of texts, right? So if we have James Joyce's laundry lists, Right, um, you know, his, sorry, his shopping list um, and his, you know, and various kinds of reminders and to-do notes. Um, we don't really have that, let's say, with late 19th century, early 20th century writers from India. Uh, these, type, these types of handwritten texts um, uh, simply weren't preserved as much or as well. This has had consequences for our digital presentation of these authors' works. I mean, there are some exceptions. The writer Rabindranath Tagore, for instance, did leave manuscripts that were carefully preserved, and these have been digitized. Um, these have been digitized at the official Tagore archive called Vichitra. Um, Tagore, of course, was like a modern Shakespeare in Bengali, um, thoroughly canonical within the Indian frame of reference, right? So in a sense, if we're looking at this as an example of a marginal or a less canonical writer that's only less canonical within a US or British frame of reference, um, this is very much the canon um, if you're looking at Indian literature. Um, we couldn't do something like this with uh, authors who were less, somewhat less well known, somebody like Ahmed Ali, or G.B. Dasani, so both writers that I've worked on and done, trying to do some archival research on, and you know, you reach a certain limit, and there's suddenly there's just no more letters for a whole decade. There's nothing, um, and it's it's gone. They were burned, they rotted, they were eaten by mice. They're they're just not there. Um, the historical archive gap has had implications for the formation um, of the field of digital humanities in the contemporary moment. Many of the primary editors of earlier digital archives published significant scholarly works. 
describing the decision-making processes as well as the new tools and technologies they developed to create the richest and most flexible possible resources. Scholars like Martha Nell Smith, Ed Folsom, Kenneth Price, and Jerome McGann have used their respective digital archive work um, uh, as, an op as opportunities to theorize what digital archives can be, and they've written compelling arguments that digital editing ought to be um, seen not as an extension of print editing, but as a fundamental transformation, the advent of a new textual editing paradigm, the move away from linear codex-bound printing allows a much more straightforward indexical presentation of multiple versions of text and modes of text, and it makes previously difficult collation of textual variants easy. The removal of printing cost considerations makes the inclusion of large numbers of images in digital collections also much easier. This, in turn, enables much greater editorial transparency and inclusiveness than was typically practiced during the era of scholarly print editing and printed texts. And the open-endedness of digital collections allows frequent updating of collections as new manuscripts and texts might be uncovered after a project is already underway. And so I'm getting a lot of that from those scholars, that is, especially I think people like Ken Price you know, have written, actually written out books about their digital archive work and um, there's a really good book called Rescripting Whitman um, that, they, that he and, um, and uh, Ed Folsom wrote together. And so there's a lot of, the, a lot of these ideas are in those, these texts. And so they've not just created them and built careers around creating these archives, but also helped to theorize what archives, digital archives are. So here are some strategies in, for responding to the archive gap, and I'll now talk about my own project that I've begun to um, kind of develop um, that will try and in, kind of have it embedded within it a kind of a, a sort of critique of this archive gap um, as I go forward. One strategy for reject, redirecting digital collections to mitigate the archive gap might entail further following a trend that is already well underway, namely to move away from single author archives towards thematic collections that show how larger groups of writers were linked together and interacting at given points in time. The emphasis on author networks um, shows how writing is first and foremost a social act, and the most successful and influential writers in the modern period have almost always been figures who were deeply engaged in intellectual conversations with a broad range of interlocutors who influenced their works. The shift in emphasis from single author to author network is also, um, also structurally brings less canonical writers into the conversation at a much earlier point. So we're not really trying, let's say, just to kind of, if we have a Whitman archive, let's have a Charles Chestnut archive that's as good and as rich. The idea is, let's look at 19th century writers in a social network, perhaps around a thematic kind of cluster of issues, and build an archive that is going to be multi-author from the get-go, right? And so we're not, we're not catching up um, and, and, and trying to kind of replicate what we did with the canon. We're just rethinking exactly from, this, from the starting point. I mean, that's kind of a little bit the problem there is, of course, that those archives are already there. So then, you know, kind of, we can say that, but we were, in fact, another way of thinking of it, de facto, actually playing a kind of catch-up game. Maybe, I mean, if you want to be self-critical. Um, uh, so yeah, so let's, so yeah, it might be more effective, as I said here, um, in the long term to produce archives that use the network paradigm to show how the minor figure and the major figure interacted and perhaps had um, a conversation of mutual benefit to their respective careers. So, I mean, I've kind of I've already said that. Um, the idea of centering canonical figures in digital archives through a network-oriented approach has informed my own thinking behind the project that I we started quite recently. I have to kind of say, I mean, in the presence of, of people like um, like uh, uh, Kim Wh Withy, um, uh, this is just at the very starting point of what I'm doing here with the Kiplings. Um, it's a I'm calling the project Kiplings in India, um, and Richard Kipling, for those who don't know the name very well, it is the preeminent. Um, author of British India, um, to the British author representing life in British India. His poems, short stories, novels, and journalistic accounts of India painted a picture of the lives that British people settled um, in India that had a huge impact throughout the English-speaking world, as well as here in the US. Much of what Kipling wrote about India, um, especially his hugely successful jungle books um, and his novel oriented towards adults um, about India called Kim, uh, most of those things he wrote after he left the country in 1888. And I've been interested in the period of time during which he himself was living and working in India, as well as his uh, parents, who were there for many um, years before him. Um, and um, kind of studying it as a formative moment. How was, um, how were they, I guess you should say, how were they learning about the country? Where did they travel? Who did they meet? One discovery has been the degree to which uh, the Kiplings actually collaborated together on their writing. Um, and so one part of the project is um, focusing on drawing the connection between, especially between father and son, a Lockwood Kipling and, and Rudyard Kipling, and also between Rudyard Kipling and his sister, um, who is, um, her name was Beatrix, um, um, people call her Trix, Trix Kipling. 
And they all publish stories um, together, um, often um, without uh, uh, kind of claiming separate differential authorship. They would publish them just simply as four Anglo-Indian authors or three Anglo-Indian authors. And you know, historically, we can, we can figure out who wrote what. And the Kipling scholars um, that I've been engaged with are very keen on saying, this is what written by Rendered, this is written by Rendered. Um, they're not very keen on what was written by Sister. And so part of what I've been interested in is, well, not just who wrote what, but also the, the, the fact of the collaboration and what did this mean for each of them, right? Not just for the great author who came out of it, but, but this kind of the idea of, of, of literary collaboration and, as being a kind of really formative and powerful experience for all three of these, um, these people. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the general, just within the Kipling family. Beyond just the family network, there's a broader circle I've been interested in, the network of voices and ideas circulating in the emergent Anglo-Indian public sphere in the late 19th century. Writer Kipling started out in India as a journalist, um, so much of my research focus has been on his newspaper work, um, and actually in his father's newspaper work as well. It was really as a journalist for the Civil and Military Gazette, um, I should have a slide, yep, the Civil and Military Gazette that we can see the young Rudyard Kipling getting what, what we might facetiously call a degree in India. Um, his reporting gave him a reason to travel to different uh, regions around the country. Um, uh, from the one where his father was employed and where he lived, he lived in Lahore, um, to talk to different sorts of people, including senior administration figures, uh, um, down to um, kind of working class Indian people that he would encounter. Um, his access to a ready-made publication venue also gave Rudyard Kipling a chance to find his feet as an author. In his first years as a writer, he published nearly everything he did creatively first in the newspaper before collecting it in books. I'm interested in charting his developing ideas and emergent authorial voice in the context of other debates that were occurring at the time, the debates about the status of Indian women in marriage law. Um, this is the time in which there was a push amongst the British to raise the age of consent for marriage for, for young women, for girls. The major religious reform movements that were underway, the Arya Samaj and the Singh Sabha movement, um, and of course the emergence of the Indian National Congress, which, which occurred during the time that, that the Kiplings lived in India. And the first meeting was 1886 or 1887. It might also be worth mentioning that in the 1870s there were two major famines, which uh, Kipling's father Lockwood covered um, for one of the Indian newspapers. Kipling also had, through his father, a rather tendentious and jingoistic orientation to British rule that remained fairly consistent throughout his career. So one of my strong desires going into this project was to make sure that it wasn't just about the Kiplings, um, but also about the India and the Indians that they may not have under understood the way we would today. Um, this makes me a little different from archivists who enter into long-term projects out of deep and unchanging admiration for their authors. I'm interested in producing an archive of the Kiplings that also makes clear that there are aspects of what they had, um, what they said and did that are problematic or even offensive. So this is an archive in, in effect that aims to critique its subject. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exploration, it's based in a certain amount of, not certain amount, it's based in a considerable amount of admiration for what they did, but it's also an awareness that the way they thought about India and Indians is not the way I see it. And so that gap, um, that differential, is something that's, that's, that's important to what I'm doing, not something that I'm just going to paper over. Um, and so exactly how to represent that is not, I'm not always um, sure I know the answer yet. I'm still working on some of those things. It is very different. The only other existing substantial Kipling archive that's out there is produced by people who are deeply passionate about this work. They're real Kipling fans. They're old school Kipling. Often there are people who are either descended from people who live or lived and worked in the British Empire, or you know, they have that kind of connection. He's one of us, and I'm not one of him. You know what I mean? And that, 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 that is an important difference. Um, part of that critique, um, and this is another way of challenging the archive gap in my own project, is to look for Indian voices in the record that might be present but remain marginal. In Lahore, where the Kiplings lived and worked, there were two daily newspapers in English, the Tribune and the Civil Military Gazette. This is the, this is the more government-oriented one. Kipling wrote for this one, this is the CMG, a newspaper that had a strong connection with the, the colonial government. Um, alongside the newspapers were numerous papers um, and uh, magazines published in Urdu, Punjabi, and Hindi, um, all during this period of the 1870s and 80s. Some were daily, some monthly, some were highly sporadic. So while I've been digitizing microfilm of the CMG, there's no um, digital archive of it, um, um, that, that exists right now, I've been looking for the archives of, um, of these newspapers with rather limited success. So many of them, um, including important Indian newspapers from that time period, just simply don't have archives that go back as far. Um, um, some do, and they're somewhat sporadic. Um, I have been finding um, there's a, a resource I've been working with and a, a group of scholars in India uh, who run um, who run a resource called the Punjab Digital Library, 
and they have some partial collections of newspapers that I'm interested in, um, including one uh, called the Gurmukhi Akbar, a Punjabi newspaper published during exactly the same period um, as, uh, as the period where the Kiplings were writing and living there. Um, and I've been looking through it, I've been translating it on my own, um, and um, you know, it's slowly and laborious. My Punjabi reading is, is uh, mediocre, and so I'm, at some point I may enlist help, but it's been really invaluable and interesting to see the gap really between what was covered in this newspaper on the same date effectively as what was being covered in the British newspapers, and just how different they really were. They really are kind of remarkable, just you would expect okay, something major happened for the, the British stuff was front page news, there's a big war in Burma happening, um, there's an earthquake, um, the, the Indian newspapers, in, especially the vernacular languages, are just not covering those things like at all. Like, in, you know, this is not important to you. I guess it's not. I guess other things are important. Um, so that's that's been interesting for me to learn, and I'm still learning. I guess as I go on on that. Um, here's another where another aspect of the archive gap comes in. While the Civil and Military Gazette was exhaustively and preserved and microfilmed, Indian language newspapers were much less well preserved. Um, those that were preserved are generally preserved by private collectors rather than government-sponsored librarians. The collections are partial and often in not very good condition. So this is one. There's a number more that I want to find, and I, I just, I'm, I'm at this early point in trying to find them. Um, interestingly, one partial source of information about what was in those papers uh, was the, in the British um, paper itself. The CMG had regular sections through the 18 and 1880s and 90s devoted to what were um, translations from what they called so that's the wrong page of the city. Um, yeah, they had regular sections where they would translate what they called the vernacular press. Admittedly, these focused on local Urdu and Hindi papers, so the Punjabi weeklies that were being published in Lahore um, are never mentioned, which maybe suggests that they didn't have anyone who read Punjabi um, working for the, the staff of the newspaper. Um, and these translations served an official government function. They were part of an extensive surveillance and censorship effort that aimed to prevent Indian language print culture from becoming a space that could subvert British authority. So they were reading these to make sure that people weren't saying things that were scurrilous or anti-British. Um, and they were presenting some of that material, right? Then that's, that's actually, there's a, there's a mixed plus right? It's valuable in the sense that, well, it gives me access to this. I don't think this newspaper is preserved anywhere, the Kashful Akbar. I just, I don't think it exists. There's no archive of it. Um, so I know a little bit about what these people were saying in that paper, but it's a specific selection, and it's specifically included. Oh, I'm out of time. I'll, or I have a, two more minutes. Okay, I'll wrap up. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's a mixed plus. You can see that it's also part of the surveillance effort. So let me, I have, to, I have just a couple minutes left. Let me just show a couple of quick things, and I will, um, I think, I, yeah, I'll just show my slides and deviate from my script, because it'll be faster. Um, some of the other things that they chose to include um, in the CMG that I've been finding and I've been trying to study and, and analyze, um, they had um, some Indian names. There's a guy named Madhava Rao, who they regularly included, and they called him, his, his column was called The Native Thinker, um, which tells you a lot, and it's a very loaded and fraught um, column title. Um, and he often, in his columns, um, was like this column, for instance, is talking about the native penchant for flattery. Um, and so how Indians like to flatter. So it's, it's underlining and reinforcing a stereotype that the British had of Indians back for the British consumption, right? So this is kind of really symptomatic um, quality to what they chose, to the kind of person they would give a column to who was Indian. Um, I mean, I've been interested in the back pages of the paper. Um, so the, the main newspaper often has very limited coverage of Indian names and voices that aren't authorized, that aren't authorized, that aren't in that kind of category, right? People who are either Maharajas, or incredibly sympathetic to the British. But there are some odd little names that I'm finding odd things happen that in these back pages. So there's one, um, there's one name that I, I've been tracing and tracking um, as I've been as seeing it uh, kind of proliferate in different pages in the back of the paper. So there's a guy named Nick Hussain, who uh, is described here as, as the accountant for the Civil and Military Gazette, and he's listed here as having a son on one of the back pages, one, on, one, on one issue. On another issue, the same Nick Hussain, and I believe it's the same person, shows up as the secretary of a religious reform society, and their meeting is summarized here. And, um, and so I'm sort of interested in that. So he has multiple kind of facets, multiple lives. He shows up also in a Kipling biography at one point. He, he worked in the same newspaper for um, 40 years, and he knew Kipling when he was there. Um, and so there's an account of him by a Kipling scholar from the 1930s who goes to visit and talks to the same guy, Nika Singh, who's still around. So I'm kind of, one of my jobs has been to take these types of straight, this is just one small example, zero minutes left, um, <laughs> take, uh, to take these kind of stray figures that appear in the margins of these papers and 
see what can be made of, connect dots, historical dots, um, kind of undergo a kind of recovery process. And if there's a story, at some point, there will be a column or a section on the archive that I'm developing that will be just about these types of figures, right? Figures that are kind of, that are almost, that we are pretty much lost to history, but not entirely. And, and so the, 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 both the British resources can be valuable in doing that, and the Indian papers as well. So one of the jobs, one possible outcome might be that I, as I get further into the Punjabi papers, that I find more stuff about this particular guy or other people um, that, I'm, that I'm sort of beginning to research. So I'll stop in that note, and thank you everyone for listening. Here. 
in British newspapers during this time period. And I have, I'm somewhat confident that it would be something in the range of 100 to 1, that, that, her, that her story was everywhere. They, they were obsessed with her and her divorce and child marriage and what's wrong with Hindu culture, and we have to reform this and fix this. Um, um, they treat the women abysmally. That's why we're here in India, right? Um, and the Indian women otherwise, I mean, even, even the character that I'm interested in, this guy, Nick, this thing I was mentioning, his wife's name doesn't appear in the paper, right? Indian women are just not there um, in the British papers, but she's everywhere. So that's the kind of thing I've been kind of beginning to play with and try to accumulate enough. The problem is I don't have full access yet, and so the quantification experiment kind of will wait a few months or a year before I even can get to that point, but that's, I'm definitely planning to try that and see what comes out. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm just curious of what computational text of analytics techniques you might be applying. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not sure yet. I'm still I'm still thinking through some of that. I, I'm I'm not learning tools. I'm, I'm new, relatively new to formal DH. I've been a digital tinkerer for a long time, but not somebody who knew how to do this kind of thing until very recently. Um, I I mean there are some things that I can imagine using those kinds of the, like some of those tools for yet, but I haven't really I don't have a great answer for it. Wondering uh, how is Kipling viewed in India now, and is there research? <laughs> There's been a lot of uh, documentation and research on Raj and general since independence, but in particular with Kipling, how is he viewed in the game? Is he involved in curriculum and in, in research and, and, uh, yeah. in, in India? He's, he's not loved in India. I think he's in some of the <laughs> No, I mean, but you know, some of the stories are still popular, they're still known. Um, I think a lot of times without reference to them. The same with the Jungle Book is just kind of this cultural, almost like a kind of cultural mythology now that is spread without reference to its author's name. Um, I think that there are kind of some of those things are still there. But I think that there's a strong awareness of the racism in many of his stories and in his comments about Indian Indians. Um, and as a result, there's been I think I should. I think that people are jaundiced in a little bit. I think there, there there could be an argument that people should be more interested in him than they are. And so it's not. I'm not interested in, in a kind of apologizing or or that kind of recovery project. But I'm interested in um, you know what's the full picture here, like the kind of the pluses and the minuses of this uh, of the work of not just him, but actually of, I would say the whole family. So so yeah, but I would say generally speaking, not he's not viewed with great love. I guess the other reason I ask questions is yeah. is there any scholarship involving him and other things were going on at the time that you're trying to research yourself. In other words, you know, events were going on at the time he wrote for the, the British. Other things that are going on, but I'm not sure I didn't understand the last part of Well, I mean, during, during that time period, so research in that time period yeah. where he would have been involved for the kind of things that you're looking yeah. at, like day to day events that oh, yeah. were by the British that researchers were looking at. I mean, I'm, yeah, there's a lot of historical religious, uh, historical material, religious material I'm interested in, religious reform movements. They were very vibrant at that point in Northern India, especially. Um, they're not things that Kipling knew about necessarily, so they're taking me away from that in this kind of, it was almost like a, a kind of um, centrifugal force where I'm starting with the Kiplings and then I find myself getting further and further away from what they actually had concrete engagement with. But they were, they were happening in the same time and often in the same place without them even necessarily knowing it. Um, so my, I have colleagues in comparative religion and religious studies that, that do talk about 1880s in Lahore, and they are, they, their eyes light up because it's an exciting, really exciting period when Indian, Indian religions and Islam were undergoing this kind of major kind of rethinking and kind of modernization of the discourses around um, what constituted those religious communities. So, and the Indian National Congress is also emerging. There's a lot of different things that are happening, and I'm researching those things um, in, in the historical record um, outside and separate from the Kiplings, but I'm also hoping to apply what I can learn there um, back into the archive project that I'm building. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Probably I should um, close. Yeah, thank you, everyone.